I'm Tammy Vendondra, host for Executive with a Cause. Today on the show, I welcome Camilla Rowland, a long-term executive and board director in the health and community service sector. She's currently the CEO at Palliative Care Australia. Today, we're going to chat about the good, bad, and hard things about running not-for-profits. Camilla, welcome to the show. Thanks, Tammy. Thanks for having me on. We actually met when you were the CEO at Mary Mead Child and Family Center. That was a few years ago. That's right. I was there for almost six years. But you have been in the CEO roles in a lot of different organizations. That wasn't even your first stint. And you've been on a lot of boards as well, haven't you? I have, and, and a lot of committees, particularly of peak bodies. Yes, but still within that community and health space. Absolutely. Absolutely. I feel like a, a lot of the people I speak to have been, you know, the CEO for an organization for a long time, or they were the founder and such. Because you've had so many different opportunities to see the insides and outs of these various organizations, I feel like you have a lot to share in terms of lessons for what works and what doesn't work. So from the all the different organizations you've worked with, are, are there common themes in terms of what works. Let's start from a business sustainability model because they all have different funding models, right? If, whether it's partially government or private care or, or private pay. Um, do you see common themes in terms of the organizations that are run well? Yeah, they're, they're, there's a number of things that make, I think, a not-for-profit really effective in terms of its leadership. The first thing is to have a really engaged board and a skills-based board. Yes, you need to have what we call that technical or clinical knowledge, sector knowledge in the board, but you also need to have all the different skills that are required to understand running a business. So essentially, although we're not-for-profit, we are still a business, but we're a mission-driven business in terms of wanting to help the most vulnerable parts of our community. So having said that, when you have a really great board, that mixed skills base, what you find is that the strategic plan that comes out of that is very well shaped and sharpened to what the mission is of the organisation and realistic. There's no point in doing a pie in the sky strategic plan if the aspirational goals in there are not going to be achievable. So these are boards and CEOs who take those plans and look at how they can operationalise them effectively with KPIs and milestones because that helps guide the CEO and it helps guide the staff teams that work in that organisation. So those are one of the things that are key about sustainability. The second thing, I think, is also understanding the financial model of your organisation. So for me, one of the things that I've seen not just here in the ACT, but in other parts of Australia I've worked in, and most of those were rural areas, was that ability to be nimble and agile around funding. So really thinking about when you're developing your budget that matches your strategic plan, what is it that you actually need to for ongoing sustainability? How much do you need to keep in reserves? What do you need in terms of government funding? Because let's be honest, most not-for-profits really rely on government funding mm. and or philanthropy. So putting together a budget which has an understanding of that mix of philanthropy, of government funding, maybe funding from a range of different government departments and different state or territory or Commonwealth departments, and then fee-for-service, what does that mean? So you need to look at the ethics of that as well, because if you're going to charge people fee for service, you can't duplicate what comes from government funding. So what are those market gaps where you can charge legitimately and ethically a fee for service? Mm. So putting forward that budget for the year ahead, but thinking longer term about what will create that financial sustainability. I want to go back first to the thing you said at the very beginning about the skill um, board. Everybody thinks about having a lawyer, you have an accountant. What other types of skills should every board have on it? It's a, we live in a really interesting world. I would now say cybersecurity, understanding systems, uh, digital marketing, digital products, cybersecurity, how that technology interface all comes together to enable things like um, telehealth, you know, um, services, uh, education services for the community online, those sorts of types of products which have really come to the forefront during COVID. The other skill set that's interesting is about culture. 
Okay. And thinking about how – we're not just talking about HR or human resources. We're mm. talking about when we take the mission of an organisation, how do we actually embed that into the, the DNA and the thinking of the staff team? So they're not just coming there to work nine to five. And, in fact, that's often not the case in, in community services sure. and health sector. Most people who work with you are quite – um, fascinated and mission driven for that particular area of work. They've often specialised in their training and in their experience in that work. So, how do we embed a culture that matches the values of the organisation, but also matches the values of the sector? Mm. So, that's a tricky one. But nowadays, we really look globally and within Australia to say, actually, culture is really important. How do you how do you quantify that? Because when you talk about culture, first of all, it's it's a very fluffy word. And when you're thinking about it from a board skills perspective, it's even fluffier. Like how do you say we want somebody with culture um, who's going to help in this cultural experience for the staff? And like how do you do that? To me, it's such a fluffy word. Yeah, that's right. That might be the scientist in you, but I'm, I'm actually an HR person ah. by background and social <laughs> worker. So I'm into the what you would say the fluffy side of things. Um, actually, believe it or not, it's not that difficult to find those people. They usually have an HR or psychology background okay. or organisational design background. Got it. And that's really key because it's not just about, you talked about quantity, it's actually about quality. Ah. And so often it comes down to what are the key attributes of the people you employ, but also the values that you embed into the um, not just into the organisation in terms of the people you recruit, but into their performance agreements, mm -hmm. into their performance reviews, into anything that you develop strategically. Um, if we think about it in Australia and we think about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander reconciliation, that's one of the values that's hold dear to all of us or most mm -hmm. of us, I would hope, all of us um, in the community and health sectors. And so we want to employ people that as part of the culture of the organisation, that they are passionate or at least committed to reconciliation. Mm. I got so many questions, but just to continue through this thought pattern right now, one of the um, things that I've noticed and from my own experience is that, you know, it's one thing when you're the founder, CEO. It's another thing when you're a CEO coming from the outside. There's already a set of values and cultural um, attributes for the organization when you get there. And sometimes it's not always positive. How do you make those changes as a new leader? Because that's a difficult transition for some people. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Uh, one of the things you talked about earlier is that I've sort of a bit of a jack of all trades. I moved across a lot of different sectors within health and community services. And I think I'm probably seen as a bit of a change agent. Mm. I'm really passionate about you know, achieving a, almost like a community development approach. So coming back to your question, what I would say is um, you achieve that cultural change when, when you come on board through a number of ways. So first off, boards usually recruit CEOs. Um, one of the top things of their list will be good cultural fit mm -hmm. with the values and the mission of the organisation. That's absolutely key because there's lots of people who can do all the things like financial management and the marketing. It's actually about that, that cultural fit. And they'll often articulate what it is that they see in terms of the mission of the organisation. So when you come in as a CEO, pretty much in any industry, not just in community services and health, you take stock. It's almost like a stock take mm. of meeting with all the key staff, in fact, all the staff team if you can, um, to find out what works well, what doesn't work well. Mm. How, what do they think the cultural alignment is within the organisation? And through that, in that first few months, as you gather that information, you start to form a picture of where you need to make change. Mm. Change management also is a really tricky thing. I remember um, when I did my executive MBA, they sort of did these leadership profile work. And one of the things that came up for me is that I move quickly and I'm energetic and I need to slow down yeah. because I can see where we want to get to. I can see this fantastic change management plan, but I need to pace it out mm. because if you make change too quickly sometimes, you can actually throw the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and you need to bring them along, right? It's yeah. not, it's not so just your job. That's what I try and do. That's my, that's my goal is to try and bring people along on the journey. So let's go back a little bit because you've been in the sector for so long that I, I don't think that you would have done that if you didn't have some reason to get involved in it in the first place. So 
why did you get involved in not-for-profits and specifically in the community and health sector? When I was growing up, we had a family member who was diagnosed with a chronic and really pervasive mental illness. And it was a taboo subject in the 70s when I was a child um, and not one that was spoken openly about. You know, I couldn't talk about it at school. I couldn't talk about it, you know, in social settings. It was sort of mental health was buried under the carpet. And um, I noticed that my parents became volunteer advocates for the sector and set up the very first mental health peak in New South Wales, actually, wow. in their spare time. Uh, and I looked at what they were able to achieve with their other um, colleagues and, and committee members through that advocacy and I remember thinking, you know, we live in this fantastic society in Australia, but there's a lot of inequity. There's a lot of social justice issues. And so I always thought as I was growing up, and I'm a bit of a people person, I really love working in teams and working with people. I'd always thought I'll go and uh, one day do social work or psychology. But when I left school um, after my HSC, I actually fell into human resources by accident and formed a career in that for the first sort of eight years post-school and studied that. And then by the time I was in my mid-20s, I thought, ah, I'm actually ready to go and study social work. So with that sort of platform of philosophy within my family about, you know, um, being advocates for social justice issues, plus in my training and doing social work at university, of course, I was surrounded by lecturers and, and, um, and people who influenced me to realise that it's not just about addressing mental health or addressing drug and alcohol. You need to address all of those things concurrently in society to have a just society. And the way to do that is through a community development approach, which you can apply to business as well. So in fact, when I graduated, I really wasn't a social worker for very long. I actually got drawn into management because of my HR background yeah. fairly early on. Yeah. And um, I really embrace that whole idea that, in fact, the majority of community and health services in Australia are delivered by not-for-profits. Mm -hmm. And those agencies have a really strong focus on mission and the strategic plans are really exciting. And so, therefore, I, as I said, I became a jack of all trades. I was fascinated with the social work side, but fascinated with leadership, fascinated with ma management, which I separate from leadership in some yeah, ways. yeah fascinated with that, um, taking along a collaborative management style, which is really actually the basis of community development. Yeah. Because you've been on so many boards now and you've been in a CEO role multiple times, what kind of advice would you give to a first-time CEO that's perhaps in the sector, perhaps not, but certainly in the not-for-profit sector? What would you advise them to do in their first year? I think to, first of all, to have a really good mentor. It may not be someone on the board. It may be someone off-site. Sometimes it's great to have a separate mentor from the from the service that you're involved with. Somebody, and I have to be honest that I very rarely paid for mentors. There's so many great people out there who are really experienced and prepared to give their time. And someone you can sound things out with um, that can lend their experience to you. I found that really valuable. Who was your first mentor? Oh, gosh. I think my first mentor was Maureen Kane, who is actually the CEO of Communities at Work. Ah. And she, I was the executive director of community services. And although I reported to her, she really was a mentor. Um, she was in that phase of her career where she'd left the public service. She had a, a really senior role. She had so much to give that I found her expertise and advice absolutely invaluable. Mm. And I look up to her um, for what she was able to do, not only with the organisation, but for the community. So she was my first mentor. In addition to having a mentor, I think it's really important to keep abreast of what is happening within, the, within business and leadership. So I read magazines from the Institute of Company Directors, from McKinsey. Um, I will read sector um, uh, newsletters from ACTCOS, the ACT Council of Social Services. All, those, all that information is really important and you filter it, but you need to be abreast because things are changing so quickly. Mm. So read that. And I think the third thing was um, I, I always believe that organisations I've been involved in leading are not just about me, it's the team that surrounds me. Surround yourself as much as possible with great managers and a great management team. Uh, because they are, in effect, 
um, part of that leadership group, sound ideas out with them, take on board their advice, really um, think of yourself as part of a management movement or a Mm. leadership movement. Look, I I think out of all those things that you've just suggested, hiring great managers is the hardest one, right? And especially in the sectors that you're talking about, they're often underpaid, overworked staff. People that are in the sector already have done it for a long time, um, sometimes burned out. How do you find good people? So that comes back to my HR background. And you really actually need to put a lot of work, I believe, into not just the skill set and the knowledge that you need to come into that position, but the attitude. Mm. And if their attitude is aligned with your attitude, I think it's going to be much more successful. So it's not just values. It's more often than not, the values are going to be in alignment. It's actually the attitude and the innovation that they will bring And I think testing that out in that recruitment process is really, really important. One of the things I have learned is that not everyone needs to be outgoing like me. Mm. Sometimes you can have an amazing quiet achiever. It's good to be challenged too. You know, I've worked in places where I've had um, managers really challenge my thinking about where we should go with a particular service to meet a particular need. And that is incredibly valuable. What you don't want is someone who's just going to be passive and go along Uh, without contributing their own ideas. A good manager, I believe, will have a level of innovation and thinking forward as well as delivering the now. When you're going through that recruitment process, like some of the things you've talked about, absolutely, but it's hard to demonstrate in that process. Are there key things that you've learned along the way, especially with your HR background, that have helped you identify who those, um, the traits of those kind of people, even though they haven't demonstrated them obviously within the workplace yet? I always think it's good to ask people for examples and to give some scenarios that they've had to be involved in. So, you know, the tough situations, if you've been involved in a tough situation with a a client or you've had to make a tough decision, how did you go about that? Mm. Who did you bring into the process? What did you learn from that? Because I'm always worried if people walk away and don't haven't learned anything because we're, we're dealing with domestic violence situations. Yeah. You know, we're dealing with all sorts of really challenging situations in health and in community services. So you need to be able to find out what are the situations that those people have been involved in and how did they, how did they um, manage those situations? And, and I think, I, I think your sector is so hard. You know, it's, I was just, um, reflecting on the fact that you're right, you know, when they're trying to help people with domestic violence or um, for a lot of the social issues that you're dealing with, they too can be the victim of of these emotional and mental health issues and, and family issues too. When people are in the sector for a long time though, I, I sometimes worry about things like P- PTSD. You know, like they yeah. too can be in a position where they've just experienced it so many times that they too have experienced trauma from from their work. Do you see that within the recruitment process? And then how do you deal with it once they're already in the in the work environment? It, it, it is a common occurrence, I believe, that people are burnt out or have PTSD and it's not picked up. What I find really interesting is that in the health sector traditionally, most people have clinical supervision, mm. not just people who are doing the actual service delivery, but the managers as well. But in community services, for some reason, funders have not always seen fit to say, actually, in your budget, you should be including clinical supervision, not just for your service delivery staff, who are your counsellors or your care workers or whoever they are, but also for your management team. And I've really thought about this a lot in the last sort of five years, that we should be advocating for and insisting that Um, managers and CEOs also receive Mm. clinical supervision because that process is when people identify that, in fact, um, they're on that border of PTSD or on that border of burnout or Mm. they're becoming overly tired. We so run the risk of not looking after people if they don't have something akin to clinical supervision, which is an incredibly different process to staff supervision. Can you describe what that really is? Because there's a lot of people that probably aren't familiar with the term. Yes, so clinical supervision allows you to reflect on your practice and how you have 
um, delivered that practice. So, and what you've learned from that and what you would do differently and what effect it's had on you personally and emotionally. I always, when I talk to clinical supervisors, they always say they become really concerned if they have someone who comes in to see them and they they talk about a scenario they've worked with. It could be with a client or it Mm. could be with other staff members and they haven't really reflected on how that's affected with them in moment sorry, reflected on them or with within them. Mm. So they start to realise that perhaps that person's starting to disengage a bit from their emotions. Mm. And we've, we've dealt with really difficult situations, um, all of us, and you need to be able to not just park it to the side but deal with it, yeah. within how it affects yourself. And clinical supervision does that. And it is usually delivered by people who actually have qualifications in clinical supervision. Yeah. For those organisations that aren't big enough to perhaps have their own resources. Are there other resources that they can tap into for that kind of help? Yeah, look, um, sometimes the EAP organisations are really great And that stands for? Um, Employee Assistance Programs. And across all industries, there are employee assistance Mm -hmm. programs, and that is often attributed to work health and safety issues. But it really is also an opportunity where someone is starting to feel that level of burnout that they should be able to speak to their EAP provider. And and that is definitely a resource within Australia. Other countries may not have those types of things. Um, What have you actually implemented within an organization that you felt like needed that support? I know you've dealt with everything from drugs and rehab to, um, you know, childcare. So death and dying. Yeah, yeah. What you're doing right now. So you've seen everything. What kind of resources have you been able to put in place in the organizations you've led? It's really tricky because like I was saying before, particularly in the community service sector, clinical supervision is not always readily available. But what I can say when I was running a drug and alcohol rehab organization is we, with the board, we worked out what the budget needed to be to ensure that there was at least uh, an acceptable level of clinical supervision put into that budget. Mm. Um, in fact, in a recent organisation, I actually, rather than subcontracting out the clinical supervision, we actually had an in-house clinical supervisor who was a psychologist. Okay. Um, that was also effective. However, sometimes when um, people have both a clinical supervisor role as well as being a manager role, staff can be reticent to go and see that person no matter how fantastic they are. They're just worried that things that are confidential might be shared. Even though they're not, there's still that fear. Sure. Uh, So I've tried to, where possible, um, put that in place in organisations I've worked in, yeah. Okay. Well, difficult jobs for anyone in those workplaces, and especially someone who's a leader in those places. I want to go back to something you mentioned at the very beginning, which is around the strategic planning and the budget and and diversifying your your funding. One thing that you said initially was that um, if you're doing government funding, to think about different kinds of government funding. There's there's a lot of not-for-profits that are heavily relying on government funding, and sometimes just one source. We've seen that with the NDIS or the National Disability Insurance Scheme when that's changed and a number that went under because of that and others that merged and um, were acquired for that reason. How do you think about those funding models when, when you inherit an organization like so many of you you have, even or on the board, that are relying on a single f- source? And it may not be so obvious that there is another source besides that one state funding or government funding um, how, how do you go beyond that? I think I'm a great one for getting external expertise in when you need it. So when the NDI- NDIS is a different kettle of fish because it's a controlled market mm-hmm. by the government and it's not, a, it's not a free market because the actual rates per service are controlled by the government. So that's, I think we'll just park that for a moment unless okay. you want to explore that because that's quite complex. Yes, it is. <laughs> but if we just talk about what I call block grant funding, uh, yep. uh, to have, there's lots and lots of consultants around that have this experience and they can help boards and CEOs unpack where do they need to, what do they need to think about in terms of their funding? I would say that you know, the great institutions that advise us on management would say single source funding is highly risky. So either you recognise that and the board understands it's high risk Mm -hmm. and they roll with that in terms of their planning. Sure. 
uh, or they look at in terms of their groups of clients and, and consumers, what is it that we can attract funding from? So it's good to sort of stream it into those different areas of philanthropy. So grants or donations or sponsors, what does that look like? What's the potential for our organisation? Mm. And go and talk to organisations like Philanthropy Australia, attend their webinars, get some expertise, um, some knowledge or external expertise to advise you on what that potential is for your organisation. The second stream is the government grants and people tend to just say, well, I'm funded from that department and that particular program and that's what I do. Mm. In actual fact, often there are opportunities to look more broadly to other government departments for aligned funding for other projects or other programs. So examine that opportunity. And the third one is really around um, that fee-for-service. You know, I feel, um, I always feel pulled in different directions about fee-for-service because I know the NDIS is fee-for-service. But if you're not doing it through NDIS or Medicare, um, or private health insurance, and people are pulling out of their pockets. The ethics are, what is it that government should be responsible for? And what is it that individual community members should be responsible for themselves? Mm. And I think that's a, a question of tension for leaders now in Australia. Mm. So I know that in the last organisation I ran, which was a child, youth and family organisation, we spent months examining what would be ethical and debating it about what could we charge not, not large fee-for-service, but when people have been on waiting lists for a year, mm. if they were prepared to pay fee-for-service so that we could get additional um, workers in to pro- or, and counsellors in to provide that service, you know, it was meeting a need. Mm. There wasn't enough government funding. What could that look like? I think boards have to really consider these days that we live in this a global world and our financials are reliant not just within Australia on what's happening in the Australian economy, but also the global economy. And we're going to have lots of ebbs and flows with finances. And so the it's really important to be nimble mm. and think about what financial opportunities you have. Well, COVID certainly infected a lot of organisations just trying to deliver a service, much less get the funding for it. And as we're looking at the global economy, are you seeing any trends or warning signs that... that um, based on all your reading and, and everything that you follow, are, are you seeing anything that is going to require these organisations to be even more nimble in the future? Yeah, uh, there's certainly reports that have come out to say philanthropy, uh, the philanthropic dollar is decreasing. The amount mm-hmm. of philanthropy that's being donated is decreasing. Uh, often what happens is when we have a financial downturn, which is happening in Australia and, and different parts of the Western world, uh, you see that donations go down. And that certainly happened during COVID in a number of sectors. Mm. We see that governments uh, start to really focus on what's going to be their priority and start to, in essence, cut back on their budgets. Like when we had the global financial mm-hmm. crisis in Australia, they cut back on their budgets. So that's that's another thing to be aware of. I guess the other thing is, is the need's going to go up. Yeah from the community because the haves and the have-nots are going to become a wider um, void between the two. So how where, can, where are you going to focus your attention? If you can't look after your whole client group, where do you focus your attention and your advocacy to meet mm. that need? Uh, one of our mutual friends, Carrie Leeson, was on the show and she's the CEO of Lifeline um, Canberra. And she was talking about how, despite the fact that the pandemic is hopefully at the tail end of it, that the the number of calls that they're getting on their suicide line or helpline it has not diminished. In fact, it's still at this. It's still up beyond previous years, and yet funding could be decreasing because the pandemic is apparently over. So, are are other organizations? Um, in that health and community space being impacted the same way, where service requirements and and community needs are actually still increasing. But funding is, because it seems like we're past that crisis now, funding is actually looking like it's going to be decreasing. Yeah, absolutely. So if I talk about the health space at the moment, what we know, for example, just in palliative care, is that 
there's been an increase in demand over the last three years of about 11% per year. Wow. Which means just over 30% increase in demand for palliative care. It's actually not people who died from COVID. It's actually the majority of people who have life-limiting illnesses that didn't get diagnosed by their doctors and treated during those lockdown phases. Now, the reason I tell you this story is that there hasn't been financial planning for that by governments mm. because we didn't know that was going to happen. Sure. So on top of our normal 100,000 per year people who have life-limiting illnesses who are going to die, we now have another 30%. Now, that won't finish as a result of a pandemic. What we do know from pandemics is that the flow-on effects continue for quite some time, if not years, a bit like war, mm. continue on for years later. So our clinical leaders are saying across Australia, that they expect that this increase will continue for at least another two years because, you know, people are now becoming symptomatic from not having been diagnosed back in 2020. Yeah, yeah. So it's the same thing with um, what Carrie's saying mm -hmm. is that people don't suddenly ha uh, address and, and overcome their mental health issues. We're talking about two years of a drastically changed lifestyle and the impacts of that it will take some time and people are very heightened. Mm -hmm. um, there was a number of reports. Uh, there was one from McKinsey and there's one from the Institute of Company Directors that talk about the fact that we can't just return everyone, for example, into the workplace full time now. Mm -hmm. People are still very heightened about the fact that there is flu out there, that there is COVID. They want to minimise the risk to their families. They want to... Um, have a change of lifestyle, essentially, and we need to look at flexible work. So I think all those impacts are going to continue for some time. Definitely, I would, but I understand that other health sectors and community sectors are, are concerned about that need will will either stay the same or grow, but we haven't planned for it yeah. in, at our state government and our federal government levels. So. We're now looking to, for example, at a national level, our new national government to say, here's the stats, here's the information. Uh, for example, in aged care, we already knew that aged care was in crisis. What are we going to do to do ma to undertake major reforms, but also to ensure we have sufficient funding to meet the need? I think it's a it's a really um, challenging, pivotal time mm. in our history. Well, can we use a palliative care example because that's where you're at right now? When we talked about funding earlier and we spoke about the different kind of funding sources, could you think about one of the organizations that might be in the palliative care space and how they, the different kinds of funding that they might use right now and then how you might see that changing over time because of these issues that we just talked about? Yeah, look, I'd be really happy to. And some of this is on public record. Um, in Victoria, there's been quite a lot of uh, media attention on uh, what's seen as a palliative care crisis in Victoria. And again, it's about not being able to meet the need or demand for palliative care. So some people are going without being able to access palliative care. Which is, we probably should explain it just in case somebody's oh, not familiar. So palliative care is for people with chronic diseases that are life limiting. Um, we used to call it terminal illnesses. So it could be anything from heart disease through to motor neurone, dementia, but at the end of the day, uh, different cancers, at the end of the day, um, someone's life will end as a result. And palliative care is a medical specialty. Um, it's very holistic and interdisciplinary, but palliative care is the care that's provided to give quality of life to people while they have that life-limiting illness mm. until they die. So it's symptom control, pain management, psychological and um, social and spiritual support okay. during that phase. Often in Australia it occurs in the last few months, but should occur much earlier if we had the funding to do that. Got it. So in Victoria there's yeah, so in Victoria, there's been a crisis and that's been well documented since about November last year. So what we know is that um, a number of Catholic agencies deliver palliative care in Australia, including Victoria. They use a combination of government funding for service delivery, but they also use donations and philanthropy to help with some of those other um, uh, needs that they have for that service. That could be buying equipment. It could be helping to fund volunteers to deliver that emotional support to families and to the patients as needed. Um, 
that level of donations and funding will probably decrease. So therefore, where do they get the money mm. to, to deliver those extra needs that they have on top of the service delivery money? Um, that, that's a, a major concern to them. Yeah, it would be. And probably many other organizations that are in similar situations. Are there, if you were to provide advice to organizations right now, just given your breadth of experience, and you've been through this before, you know, this is not your first financial crisis, is there anything you could provide them in terms of advice for preparing for this time? I think there's a, there's a, a, a few things. One is um, a, a probably a bit of a story, and that is that deli- develop collaborative um, advocacy on topics. So, you know, engage with your peak body, but definitely pull together case studies and stories for the funders Mm. and provide evidence. Evidence enough is not alone. Data is not enough is, is not alone. Sorry. Data itself is not enough. It needs to be the stories and the case studies of how people are affected. And when, if you do that as a collaborative uh, effort, Often um, politicians and heads of departments can see then the likely impact. And we did that around one of the NDIS um, service delivery categories um, about five years ago when we realised that what had happened was that the amount of money that they had put per service and the number of hours it allocated per client wasn't nearly sufficient and that those families were likely to go into crisis um, as a result of this miscalculation. Mm. So we collaboratively pulled together and six agencies wrote, we, I wrote on behalf of the six agencies, to um, the head of the NDIA, to the minister, and eventually over some months. And we also had the data from an independent source. One of the mid-tier accounting firms here in Canberra did some modelling for us for, at a very cheap price. That was They were amazing. That was RSM. And we took the data we took the case studies and the letters, and at the end of the day, the board members and the chair of the NDIA overturned the original mm. costing and in, in introduced a costing that uh, was and a way of assessing that was going to be much more um, uh, adequate for those families. So collective advocacy, mm. that's one thing. Uh, one of the other things is to think about how you um, are going to prioritise and manage your services. And that's the toughest. I'd say it's the toughest thing is to cut a service or to stop a service that you know has been effective. It is heart-wrenching. And uh, we, in fact, in my last agency I ran, we actually found an increase in donations during COVID because it was so dear to the community. The community in Canberra had really embraced this service and understood it was so important for young adults with disabilities to be engaged in this particular service. And it was because we had highlighted the stories of this service and how important it was. But the government funding for that particular service uh, really decreased during COVID and because it was through fee-for-service basis through the Mm -hmm. NDIS. Uh, And what we needed to make sure was that it kept going. But, you know, the board and myself a few times were saying, what do we do? How do we keep this going? And we were trying to think of innovative ways that we could partner. So that's another opportunity is to partner with other agencies. Mm -hmm. And we we did that as well. So, yeah, I think I feel really feel for any CEO that has to cut a service that you know is absolutely imperative. Yeah. I, I think it's interesting you talked about that storytelling not-for-profits, especially charities, are really good about storytelling to their constituents or donors in general. You just talked earlier, though, about sharing those same stories with government. And I don't know that we're as good as doing that. Like, we're really good about telling the donor the story of, of that person or that animal or whoever that they helped, but not necessarily doing the same when they go to government for funding. I think that's a real lesson learned for for other organisations out there. Yeah, it's really um, been brought home to me with the most recent federal election. I was really lucky to get some pro bono advice from um, what I would call Australian leaders in politics and advocacy who said to me, don't ever underestimate the power of a story to illustrate your point. Because if you think about it, politicians have half hour meetings all through the day. Mm. They have many people coming to them with needs a story will resonate. 
yes, you need to have your data, you need to have your rationale and your arguments, but a story will resonate and remain with them. Mm. And I, I, I think as a sector we don't highlight those individual stories enough. Yeah, definitely. And they need to be real. Oh, yeah. 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 But because Well, no, because some people write scenarios that are ah. not real and the authenticity is really important. You can change names, but authenticity is incredibly important. Yeah, absolutely. And and certainly harder with privacy laws to um, to share stories sometimes. But yes, yeah. Is there anything else, Camilla, with all of your experience that you might want to to say? Look, you know, for those people in this health and community sector, not for profits in general, something to um, something that you learned from a lesson of the work that you've done that you think would be really useful for them as executives? Yes. I, I went on to boards because I was very passionate about the causes of those agencies and um, some were little agencies and, and boards and some were very big. What I've learned is that as a CEO, when I've been on boards, I've understood my own boards better. Um, I did a company director's course, which was amazing, not just to learn to be a good board member, but to also be a good CEO and how I interact with my board. I I have found that the lessons go both ways. Board work can really help a CEO. Mm. Um, and, and the other hand is that when I'm on boards, I really understand that the pressures that the CEO is yeah. under and the importance of how you work together. Mm. Uh, the it's probably not a lesson learned, but something that's just about me and my nature is I'm a pretty open book most of the time. And I've always been incredibly transparent with my board. Um, no matter who I've worked with, I've always just said, this is how it is. I've never hidden anything. Um, but I do come across CEOs sometimes who think, oh, I'll manage this. And it's not that they're doing anything that is wrong. It's more that they're thinking, I'll try and manage this for as long as I can before I have to let the board know. Mm big lesson for me is let the board know at right near the start as things are emerging that there's almost like that traffic light you know there's a, mm-hmm. there's an or, code orange starting to emerge so that they're not blindsided so that they're prepared let people know how you're managing it um, and get their advice boards are there to help you as well I think that is fantastic advice I I've always worked under the the rule of no surprises, whether I was in the board or the CEO. I just like no surprises. And if there was a surprise, then someone was going to be in trouble. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Great. I, I'm cognizant that we're about out of time. Um, is there anything that we can do as the, our listeners to support your work right now? Uh, in palliative care? Mm-hmm. I think it's another taboo subject. You know, I've worked in drug and alcohol where it was taboo and it really isn't taboo as much anymore. I mean, mental health was taboo. End of life is probably the most taboo subject still left on this planet. Mm. And the care that's needed to support someone as they're dying, what listeners can do is think about the fact that one day we'll all die Mm. and be open in conversations with people in your family and with your colleagues about... Uh, what palliative care is and how important it is to have quality of life and care at end of life. And so, therefore, let's have those conversations. Let's stop it from being a taboo subject and bring it out into the open and have those discussions more freely, as we do with birth. Mm. You know, we talk about birth. We should talk about end of life. Yeah. And um, that, for me, is the greatest uh, awareness raising and support that we could ask for. Well, it's definitely been top of mind lately with all the conversations about assisted death, right? Um, I think I think it is becoming more of a, a topic that people want to talk about and, and also to be able to make decisions about it as well. So um, if people want to know more about uh, Palliative Care Australia and the work that you're doing, uh, what's the website? The website is palliativecare.org.au. And if they want to um, know more about you or um, you personally and the work that you're doing, uh, what's the best way to connect? Is it LinkedIn or? Probably LinkedIn. I, I, I am on LinkedIn, but they can certainly contact me at Palliative Care Australia as well. Great. Camilla, thank you for joining us today. I, there were so many great lessons learned in that conversation. I feel like um, regardless if you're in the community or health sector or, or any other not-for-profit sector, that there's a lot of things in there, especially that last part about working with boards. I think that is really one of the most underrated and underestimated of things that a CEO can do well or not. 
Yeah, thank you. And look, um, I'm still on a learning journey. I believe in lifelong learning. So this, you know, not perfect. There's uh, still a lot to learn. And sometimes when I'm mentoring other CEOs, which I do, um, or executives, I learn so much from them as well. So thanks. It's fantastic. Thanks for the amazing work that you're doing for the community and right now for those in the palliative care space. We really, um, you know, as a community, we need more people like you. So thank you so much. Thanks, Tammy. Hi, this is Tammy again. When I'm not doing podcasts, I'm helping not for profits with IT decisions. The question for this week's IT in plain English segment came from a client. The question is, what is a UPS? A UPS, or uninterruptible power supply, is essentially a big battery. It's used to power important devices like your servers or telecommunication systems in case there's a power failure. Now, if you have a third party providing you these services offsite, you probably don't need to worry about this because they should have the power backups in place. However, if you host any of this equipment yourself on site, this is really important for a UPS. Imagine the power going down in your building and your website going down too because you're hosting it on your own server. If you have more than one location, imagine the power going down on one site and no other site is able to access your systems or even your telephone systems. What I will commonly see in these organizations that host their own equipment is that they do have a UPS, but it'll only last for one to two hours. Why? Because the longer batteries are very expensive. Now, there are a number of ways to mitigate this risk, but the first thing you should do if you're hosting your own equipment on site is to talk to your IT manager or outsource provider and find out what would happen if the electricity went out to all your systems. Then build this risk and mitigation strategy into your continuity plan. So there you have it in plain English. If you have an IT question you want answered, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn and send me a message. I just might answer it on the show. And if you like what you've heard, please subscribe and leave me a review. To all of you executives with a cause, the world is definitely a better place because of what you do. Thank you for what you and your teams do every day.